Got to find a way to keep the paw sock right. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Question is the money. I think if you checked most Rhode Islanders, they would tell you, yes, we want to keep the paw socks. But there's that uh, hangover of 38 studios on public-private partnership that I think is problematic. And there's just the, the real dollars and cents. Mayor Don Grebian from Pawtucket has done, I think, yeoman's work in keeping this game alive, all pun intended. And he's here tonight to talk about it. So don't go anywhere. Great to have you aboard. Thanks for tuning in. Let's check into the rundown and see what's going on. And there's a lot going on. So Rex Tillerson was confirmed. Um, we have a headline here that reflects on that. He was confirmed yesterday and actually met with the State Department employees in a live broadcast hello earlier this morning. In the meantime, Donald Trump was very busy at the prayer breakfast, and uh, word is now that we've got a little bit of a tension convention with Australia. It's all in the day's news for our presidents. President Donald Trump gave a speech at the National Prayer Breakfast to say changes are needed in America's immigration policies to protect American values. There are those who would seek to enter our country for the purpose of spreading violence or oppressing other people based upon their faith or their lifestyle. One policy the president says he'll now review is an Obama-era deal to allow more than 1,000 Muslim refugees to leave Australia and come to the U.S. On Twitter last night, the president called it a dumb deal. President Trump and Australia's Prime Minister talked about that deal during a phone call over the weekend. There are now reports the conversation did not go very well. When you hear about the tough phone calls I'm having, don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it. They're tough. We have to be tough. It's time we're going to be a little tough, folks. We're taken advantage of by every nation in the world virtually. It's not going to happen anymore. Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull says the deal is still on. Uh, the president assured me that he would uh, continue with uh, honour the uh, agreement we entered into with the Obama administration with respect to refugee resettlement. President Trump also called attention to Iran, tweeting that the U.S. has put Iran on notice for firing a ballistic missile. You know, the notice is kind of interesting with the new NSA director, who hails from Rhode Island, putting Iran on notice yesterday. No Security Council meeting, no process, no nothing in order to come up with that deduction, which again is a new way of doing business, precarious as some might think it is. Uh, Donald Trump, you know, at the prayer breakfast, though, just couldn't contain himself. Uh, look at this headline. It's getting a lot of attention. Of course, I don't know why he does this. He has substantive conversation wherever he goes, but he always has to mitigate it by this kind of silly, stupid stuff. Uh, here's what he said. He had tremendous success on The Apprentice, and when I ran for president, I had to leave the show. That's when I knew for sure I was doing it. And they hired a big, big movie star, Arnold Schwarzenegger, to take my place. And we know how that turned out. <laughs> the ratings went right down the tubes. It's been a total disaster. And Mark will never, ever bet against Trump again. And I want to just pray for Arnold, if we can, for those ratings, OK? Uh, really? I, 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 really? Now, of course, Arnold uh, responded. Um, you've probably seen it's running viral right now. Suggested that uh, uh, he switch jobs with Donald Trump. You know, Donald could go back to The Apprentice, and he would take over the White House and bring calm to the country. Okay. Moving on, 38 Studios comes to a anticlimactic halt, sort of. Headlines here, uh, Rhode Island settles for $16 million with last defendant in 38 Studios. This was the former Southwest financial advisory company that uh, was in the middle of this mix and actually had conflict of interest, you know, doing other service for the state while it was a defendant in this 38 Studios debacle. Um, they were on the hook. I told you that this would never go to uh, a, a, a court case. It would never go to a trial because they were the last defendant. And if they had lost in a civil litigation, they would have been responsible for the entire gap of it's still another $30 million that the state of Rhode Island is owing the bondholders. So th that was predictable. Um, Governor Raimondo reacted to it yesterday. It's going to be the court that decides. Uh, I'm on the side of transparency, and I'm going to go to the court and say, let's release everything. Meaning all the documents all the way up until this point, depositions, the whole nine yards, the state police investigation, the grand jury stuff that Peter Kilmartin, our attorney general, is holding back. Uh, but that's not enough. 
This governor promised in the campaign to uh, do an independent investigation of 38 Studios. Now, it is such a long, lagging story that it exhausts everybody, no doubt, and I doubt that there's a hue and cry from the public for this. Um, but no one's going to complain, literally, about a million or a million and a half dollars that she says it would cost to investigate 38 Studios against the kind of penalty we paid with this debacle, not having this deck formally cleared, investigated, adjudicated, and politically evaluated uh, and put to bed will continue to create a cloud lingering over this state, which will impact deals like the one we're going to talk about with our guests coming up. She doesn't get it. She reneged on her campaign promise and she should reconsider even now. Uh, this is a debacle of, of, of a minor type, but it's just part of the saga of Moira Walsh, the new state representative in Providence, headline here on the front page of the newspaper. I'm actually questioning the journalism here. Why off Facebook posting that this end up on the front page? Highlight that, will you, Jess? Uh, Walsh fired from cafe job. Moira Walsh, who has been on this program on a number of occasions, is a, uh, I think we have a video of her, she's, uh, there she is, uh, she is a, a waitress by trade and uh, was first introduced to the show arguing for higher minimum wage for wait help. Uh, she's been now elected and uh, she considers herself kind of a fire plug, my words, I mean it's all sorts of words that she's used to describe her own advocacy. Um, but reportedly she got bounced from her job as a waitress because the owner, she says, um, well, it, there's a dispute. Let's just put it that way. Why that ended up on the front page without actually consulting the owner journalistically is beyond me, and why we write stories off anybody's Facebook post is also a puzzle. Um, but this will be a little bit of a mini saga. My guess is she'll end up gainfully employed somewhere by somebody who sees her politics as a plus. But you know what? An owner has the right not to have politics discussed in his place if he doesn't want to. Politics is a different form of First Amendment right. You can say anything you want on the street, but when you're under the employee of somebody, it's a different story. We may dig into this a little bit more uh, if it becomes any larger of a state house drama, but what are you going to do? All right. Uh, this was a nice moment yesterday for the folks here in this building. Uh, you should know that uh, this uh, television station and this program, part of the employee of uh, the overall managing operation for Eyewitness News and Kim Kalunian, who uh, for a period of time was my radio news anchor and now is a full-time reporter and an outstanding reporter for Channel 12, had a historic moment. Look at this headline. Uh, she was the first ever person to question a White House press secretary at the White House press conference in this new project they're doing to create a Skype input. So all the reporters show up and now all across the country there'll be a handful of reporters who get to ask questions on Skype. Here's how it looked in part. Soon should cities like Providence expect to see their federal funding cut? As we continue to implement this executive order and fulfill the pledge that he made, we'll have further updates on how we tend to, how that list will come out and when it will come out. Uh, so I look forward to following up on that as well. The question was about sanctuary cities and the executive order putting on notice vaguely that some cities would suffer if they didn't abide by whatever immigration program Donald Trump wants to enforce. What Kim did was ask a terrific and responsible question. What she also did was billboard for Rhode Island and for, well, for the world and for Donald Trump at the White House that Providence was a problem. And the way Donald Trump operates, I'm guessing he wrote down Providence. Uh, I wonder if the mayor of Pawtucket will have anything to say about that when we ask him about drawing attention with this kind of a White House. Uh, too much. By the way, there's a relationship with Sean Spicer because he is a Rhode Islander. Uh, I'm glad they hurried up this inaugural opportunity because my guess is Sean Spicer won't last six months the way he's comported himself as press secretary, but that's just my prediction. All righty, the future of the Paw Sox. Here's a couple of headlines that uh, sponsor our conversation here today. McCoy location deemed efficient. And that may not have been a surprise for a lot of folks because there were some preliminary studies, and I guess the number's anywhere from 68 to $78 million to either repair it or replace it. The good mayor, Pawtucket, is here. By the way, you got anything to say about uh, immigration? Do you want to get on any no, front page listen, news? I, I'm for, right for now, so I'm glad that Kim yeah. used Providence as an example, <laughs> so we're good. <laughs> oh, by the way, not, not for nothing, not that you were invited here, but that is, <laughs> what, what, in, in, in this very, very fluid discussion of sanctuary. Where does Pawtucket sit in there? Pawtucket's not a sanctuary city right now. However, you know, we're always cognizant of, of the population that we rep represent. So uh, Governor Chafee a couple of years ago, or a few years ago now, had kind of said that 
Rhode Island was a sanctuary state. So we've always followed that. So the police are out there. They they won't go reporting them directly if it's but it goes through the court process. So you're so operating just the way everybody else, else is, is in the absolutely. state. You're just not puffing your chest out about it right no, now. No, no. And, and, and Probably wise. You've got other we're things concerned. to do. We're concerned, absolutely. There's, yeah. there's, 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 it's a priority. We've got to balance that, but you're absolutely right. Give me uh, the first 60 seconds, and then we'll elaborate in the next segment about where we are with this study. Was it good news, bad news? What was it? Uh, for me, uh, you know, personally as a mayor of Pawtucket, you never want to see the reality. But it was good news where I think that people now understand the true needs of it. You know, whatever the investment is, whatever it is we're going forward, it was what well, we heard for two years. We were here years ago, uh, a few years ago, and they were moving. We now have an honest assessment as the mayor of the city of Pawtucket. Whether they stay, whether they go, I still need to have an honest understanding of what those needs are in that building because the city owns that property, that building, so we have that responsibility. So that study is very important to us. Mm. When we come back, we'll break it down and see what the options are. Don't go anywhere. All right, welcome back in. Here's what Eyewitness News reported on this McCoy Stadium Challenge. Do the benefits outweigh the costs? An outside study of McCoy Stadium's future suggests they don't. Renovating will likely generate minimal return on the public investment other than the jobs and taxes generated by the construction. That's a direct quote from a new study on the stadium released Friday. An economics professor at Holy Cross, Victor Matheson, agrees. The economic benefits from building a new stadium uh, are much, much, much smaller than any possible costs. The sports economist says about half of the nation's minor league teams play in stadiums built in the past 20 years. Those teams successfully lobbied for their highly subsidized venues. You very rarely see, uh, however, uh, teams willing to put their own money into significant stadiums at the minor league level. So who will pay for McCoy? If you're a taxpayer, you might be saying, well, uh, you know, why should I be paying for a stadium that someone else gains all the benefits from? David Norton is one of those taxpayers. I think the solution for the owners who are millionaires and billionaires is to invest their own money into uh, a team that they believe in and to stop asking Rhode Island taxpayers to pay for their private business venture. Born and raised in Pawtucket, Norton fought for the team to stay and not move to downtown Providence. But now he worries the Paw Sox could once again threaten a move. Yeah, but you know, hey, you know what? You can't have it both ways. You know, David Norton's been on this program before and we'll invite him back in. And of course, the economics professor has been on this program as well. And, uh, and Wax is poetic about this kind of stuff. Look, the tradition has been fortunately or unfortunately, that public-private partnerships invest in sports venues. If we want to say we're no longer part of that, uh, that dynamic, that's another conversation altogether, it seems to me. I mean, you know, let's talk about the process. The one thing that's been really good about this process is we've been able to build a relationship with the, those who didn't want to build the relationship or didn't bother to build the relationship up front. Um, so Meaning the new ownership. The new ownership. Of the you know, the, they've been excellent partners at the table. You know, we did this study and we had it where it was uh, split three ways, uh, city, state, and the ownership. Right. A and that was how we built value with each other. Um, and, and trust, you know. They clearly have a mission um, from an organization standpoint. They are driven by profit, right? We as a community have a responsibility to provide a venue um, and hopefully continue to provide that venue. But it's got to be, there is investment on both sides, but at the end of the day, they understand the importance that they need to put skin in the game and much more skin in the game than they did the last time. That's clear. I don't know what that number is, where we're at, because it's going to be a couple of different ways. If it's, you know, at McCoy, and clearly the report has shown that it's going to be difficult to build there, but if there if there's investment from the city and from the state, you know, you look at it a little differently. If there's those public investments, you know, maybe it stays there. We don't expect a higher return economically because that always becomes the economic return. If you're looking at it purely business, as the professional said, absolutely it belongs in a different location. But we need to also ba value that family fun, you know, and that value so people can afford to have that. You know, we're trying to balance all those things, so it's going to be an interesting conversation. Well, it's always, you know, it's really fascinating. The convention center, uh, you know, the downtown absolutely. facilities, they bleed. Yep. Um, they bleed, but there's an economic, uh, there's an economic uh, turnover that wouldn't be there if we didn't have the bleeding entity. It's a cost, uh, it's really a lost leader uh, for taxpayer incentive to create economy. Um, 
it'll be the ratio and the numbers, no doubt. And then again, there's the option to be able to move it to another place. What's the reality of this Apex site? Because I drive by there and think, geez, I wonder. I've thought about that before and, and talked about it on the air. And then surprisingly, it seems to be part of a percolating conversation. Yeah, yeah. And, and we have not had any conversations with the owners. This is purely a private business venture. But one thing that we did as a city when we started to see that, you know, the McCoy was going to be challenging or a very uh, high cost, we started looking and I had the responsibility to start looking at, okay, how do I keep them? I fought to keep them at McCoy. Right. If it's not going to be McCoy, and we haven't given up on that, so I want to be clear, that. right? Having said, we're in Pawtucket, so we looked at a few sites. It can physically fit on the current uh, uh, land of McCoy, the field. We're not talking about parking. We have to take a look at parking, how we would... You're talking about the Apex. The Apex it could, site. It could, the the, you the know, stadium so could fit there. We took a GIS map. We took a stadium, Got all it. their configurations. It'll fit there. Okay. What it parking and transportation accommodations are to be determined? You got it. Absolutely. All the infrastructure that would have to go with it, what's on there, we never looked at it. It was just, okay, can we put it there? Whose responsibility is it to really investigate that? Yours, the teams, the states, whose? I think it's, I mean, at some point in time, I think it's going to be a combination. But right now, this is a private business trying to do a private venture. And they are looking at having conversations to build that relationship with them. It really becomes part of their conversation, and they're taking the lead on that. Will so you form an entity that reflects the kind of shared revenue, uh, the shared expense that you pulled for the hundred thousand dollars study, to actually? In other words, will you will you commit to commit to keeping them there with the state, the city, and the team, forming a no holds barred. We're going to be here. Let's figure out how to do it. Committee. Absolutely, and that's what we 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 got out Seems of this. Seems to me that'd be the first step. Absolutely, and that's what we're trying to do. Right? We so we've got the governor who understands that it belongs. We've got first. Let's say this. We've got the commitment of the Pawtucket uh, Paw Sox ownership that they want to be in Pawtucket. Okay, so the first thing was the study. They have committed to stay in Pawtucket, right? So now you start looking at the economic investment. So Apex becomes that location. Together, the value that we've built, this partnership. And when I say partnership, I want to be clear. It clearly is not going to be equally split between the state, the city, and the Paw Sox ownership for future investment as it was um, for the study. You just can't do it. The city doesn't have the capacity. The state has only a certain capacity and the ownership. But there is going to be some sort of a mix if we're going to be able to do this. At some point in time as we go through this uh, process over the next several months and make that determination, they hit till 2020, right? Hopefully we make this work. We're committed to make it work, but it's got to be fair to the ratepayers yeah. and everybody it else. It just seems to me that, that the Pawn Sox have to continue and put in writing that they're committed more than spiritually to being here past 2020, to building a new facility, and then it's just details and selling the project to, to the, the citizens, because there's no doubt there'll be some kind of bonding program that will be referendum-based. It's going to have me. to be, right. It is Both a, in the city of Pawtucket and, and in the, the state. state. Absolutely. There's right. going to have to be in order to have them stay here, even if you're reinvesting in the state. Well, look, you did a great job of holding this thing on, rebuilding that relationship. I mean, this is one of the best municipal diplomatic uh, uh, efforts I've seen in a long time. I don't throw out a lot of compliments. You know that, Mayor. Um, uh, and I asked you way back when, you know, what are the chances, and I don't remember what it was, 200, 300, you know, 20, yeah, 30 percent. Well, what, what do you think now? Oh, I, I believe after the relationship that we've built, you know, we will have that partnership, and I believe that they will continue to stay in the city of Pawtucket. I really do. Mayor's got some thoughts on some other issues. He was actually spouting off about that college education thing that I don't like very much. <laughs> stay tuned. All right, listen, uh, Mayor Grebian's kind of weighed in supporting Governor Raimondo's two-year free education plan. Why? Um, we, first of all, we met this morning a group of mayors find it very, very important as we look at how we broach and, and continue the education to give a lot of my residents that opportunity. The concept is great. We talked about the concept is so important when you're looking at all of the money we've invested from K to 12 and how do we go beyond that. And there is a lot of debt that the uh, students have uh, that will collect. It's important to us, you know, the governor, to her credit, sent, put out this initiative. The details are going to have to be worked out. You know, there's clearly some of those well, things. Well, what's the concept that you, that you guys are supporting? Uh, that, because, she, look, uh, so in case you don't know, the, the governor is suggesting two years of free college education for everybody, beginning with the class of 2017. So if you go to CCRI for two years, it's no charge, as long as you're there full time and you're applying yourself uh, at a 2.0 level, by the way. Um, if you're a junior or senior, uh, well, if you're going to RIC or URI, your junior senior years yeah. would be no charge exactly. if you're on course full time and you've got a 2.0. And it's for everybody, no matter what your finances are. Um, 
Hey, look, I'm all about $30 million. If you want to put that into the college system here, it's been woefully inept, the, the state's contribution to our state college system, and they're phenomenal institutions, so no arguments there. But no means testing, no merit-based, and, 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 and mayors are now going to get behind this with, 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 with that logic? No, and I think that some of them, and this is what we said today, take Mayor Avedesian for a minute. He comes from the perspective of serving on the higher ed board over at CCRI, sure. right? Yeah. So he comes, he knows the important entity, so he sees that as a connection. We've had other mayors like myself who are sitting there saying, okay, what is the give back? There are some, Mayor Policy, at his credit, have conversations who are some support of it, would like to see some sort of a, what you would call, not such an upfront means test, but if we're going to be paying that, let's put some community service hours back into the community. Um, so I think all of those kinds of discussions are going to happen. The overall concept, we all want to make sure that our students are given that, provided that education. It's okay, what can they give back? Is there a better means test? And I think you're gonna see all that flush out as a general oh, well, assembly. And you're also, it's, it's incongruent. The class of 2016 will be sitting in the same classes as the class of 2017 at a college level. Won't be there for nothing. That's, Won't be there for paying the full vote. That's not smart. Uh, car tax is gonna be really heated. What's your uh, one minute analysis of what uh, Pawtucket's perspective is? Your rate's what, 50 and change We're 5330, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> We're the second highest, it was inherited. Those are the challenges. You know, we only have a $500 exemption. Uh, you know, we've done a lot of cutting over the years. You know, our tax rate has dropped, you know, over from our residential. But the car tax becomes the issue is we need to be equally funded. You know, whatever the state decides to do, you know, the governor's proposal with the 30 percent um, sounds good, but we don't hit the bottom folks that maybe need it as much. You know, you who's going to drive your Lexus, me who's going to drive my Dodge Charger, right? We're not going to be able to afford the same, right? So having said that, I just think there's going to be a lot of debate. I see a lot of good things coming out of this conversation. You got a shot at my Lexus? Oh, it's not a Lexus? No, it's oh, not Mercedes? a Lexus. All right. It's not a Lexus. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think there's going to, this has to be. You know, it's an unfair tax. It's got to be. We've talked about, we had a League of Cities and Towns meeting this week. I'm the president of the League. We're talking about it has to be a fair assessed value, whether you go to the manufacturing and you start talking about percentage. We are sending a letter to the speaker and to the Senate president and the governor. We want to be part of the solution because it is going to affect the municipality. It's really complicated. So yeah, uh, I, the, the mayoral former government needs input in that, no doubt. By the way, it's a Honda Accord okay. V6. Nice coupe, though. Pretty sporty. <laughs> <laughs> Just work on the baseball. All right? Got it. All right. Stick well, to it, too, right? Final word and we can left. <laughs> Stay with us. This ridiculous tradition lives on headline... Okay, Punxsutawney Phil predicts more winter. Well, I hope it's not the winter. By the way, the last time I remember us having this kind of mild winter pre-Super Bowl, we had the worst ever February that I think we've ever had ever, 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 ever. So don't get cocky about getting your golf clubs out in the middle of February. I don't think it's going to happen. All right, tomorrow night we're going to take a look at the constitutionality of a lot of what Donald Trump has been doing in the first two weeks with an expert on constitutionality from uh, a local university. And uh, I know you're getting ready. You're hydrating for the big game. And that's what we're supposed to call it, the big game, which is a bit weird, don't you think? We'll see you on the radio tomorrow at 3 on WPRO. Thanks for watching. Good night.